But for next week, you guys are supposed to turn in registration. The PHP way. Which means, and I'm going to be referencing all the time my Timex. <coughs> if you guys remember, and I'm going to show you the static version on my website. These are my 10 pages. No code. It fools you, right? Because it seems to be working. Everything is linked together. Basically, the same stuff that I expect to see when I grade your assignments that you turn in Sunday. Okay? And registration is one of them. So notice that in registration, it does not allow me to register when I have blank. There's a minimum of stuff that I have to put in here in order to be able to get the registration. And that's JavaScript stuff. You guys already have done that. You know how to do it. It's client-side JavaScript code that validates what I'm inputting. But next week, you guys are going to take each one of these values that you put in here, and you are going to save it into the database that it's due two days from today, into your user, employee, I don't know, yada, 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 table. Okay? Whatever you call it. If you guys remember, I share with you my database. That's what I thought. Okay. So here's my database, Timex. And here's my users or employee my case I call an employee table and I have an ID which is automatically generated and a name and an email address and an employee type a password which I'm not asking you to turn it in encrypted yet you can turn it in clear text for now manager ID employee ID address CD state zip code pay rate a tax rate registration ID blah 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 whatever all this stuff that makes up my users. Okay? I'm going to have to create a program in PHP that will capture all these and put them there. So, let's go back and forth. Employer ID. That's something that I input. employee ID. Typically it's a social security number or some kind of uh, end number. <laughs> like the end number that NSU give us. Right? Just to make sure that it's not the social security number. <clears throat> that goes here. The full name. That goes here. Under name. The password and re-enter password. Are you going to save both? No. doesn't make sense. You're going to save just the one. The other one is just for validation purposes. Okay. So you're going to save the password. The email address. The employee type. Notice that on the front, which is supposed to be user-friendly, says hourly, manager, executive, administrative. But on the back, which I don't really care about friendliness in the back, what I care in the back is save the data quickly. Okay? Notice that in the back, I save H for hourly, M for manager, E for executive, and A for whatever the other one was. Okay? So you somehow you're going to have to do that conversion. 
Do you? Eh. Not if you design it correctly. Let's do a firebug on this guy. What is it? A select statement. You guys see this? Just because I display hourly doesn't mean that the value that will get passed to the back should be hourly. It can be age. Same with manager, same with executive, same with administrative. That's where the value is coming from. All right. What else? Manager. Teresa Walker, Tom Brady, Alvarez. Just because I'm showing a nice user-friendly name of a manager doesn't mean that I'm going to be saving the full name in the database. Does it make sense? Yes. Because if I allow my employees to type their manager's name, I'm going to get for the same manager 10 different names. Spell out differently. Oh, I don't know. Is it a C? Is it a Z? Is it an S? I don't know. Well, same thing. In the back end, you're just saving the manager ID. Remember, that's the relationship between employee and its manager. It's a self relationship. So, on the front end, I'm expecting you to have done the work. And what is the work? That the select manager contains as their values the IDs of those managers. Get it? If you haven't done that, do it. What's the reason for not having the full name? That's a very good question. Okay. What if instead of passing Teresa Walker's employee ID, you pass the full Teresa Walker name? What are you going to save in the registration table under employee ID? I mean, under manager. Their full name? If six months down the road, Teresa Walker marries Joe Smith and becomes Teresa Smith, guess what's going to happen with all the manager IDs that save Teresa Walker? That's just one problem of referential integrity. That's what it's called in database management terminology, referential integrity. There's no integrity anymore. She changed her name. All of a sudden, there's a lot of people that report to Teresa Walker that doesn't even exist. What's the other problem with saving Teresa Walker's full name as the manager? No. The fact that manager ID is just a byte. While Teresa Walker, and I've seen names that are like 50 characters long, repeatedly on every single one of its his or her employees. It's a lot of wasted data. So, once again, make sure that you, s yeah, user friendly. I, I don't want to see what I've seen in some websites that turn and are turned in by by students that. Oh my god, I have to save the manager ID. The heck, I'm going to show just the manager ID. So I see under here, I see manager 1, 4, and 5. Oh, like, are you serious? Like, am I going to know who is manager ID 1, 4, or 5? Come on. And it's just making that connection, the fact that you 
are showing Teresa Walker doesn't mean that that's what it's going to get posted on the server. Okay? Understand that. All right. Address, city, zip code, state. What about state? Whoops. I, I can't remember, to be honest with you. Yes, two letters. Two letters. And in the back end? Yeah, two letters. Now, everything that I ask in registration is saved in the database? It should. Is everything that is in the database coming from the registration? Just go through the fields. Is pay rate coming through registration? Oh, cool. I can decide what my pay rate is <laughs> in registration. Does it make sense? No, be nice, right? But it doesn't make sense. Tax rate. Is tax rate coming through re registration? No. Is this registration date coming through registration? No. I don't get to decide when I registered. That's a time event. And you guys have to fulfill um, the goal of trying to keep the truth on the registration, which means the employee should not tell you when he or she registered what's their pay rate, what's their tax rate, or when did they register. And indeed, those are three fields that are part of registration, that are part of the employee, I should say, I'm sorry, that are part of the employee. Okay? So somehow, we're going to have to be able to fulfill those during or after registration. So how on earth do we get this data saved in the database? Now, keep in mind that all this stuff shuts down. So, um, so all this information, when you click on register, it gets posted. Where does it get posted? You guys remember? There's a full table. Somewhere in here, it's got to be a form. Here it is. This whole thing, this whole thing is the form. So when I click on the register button, all that input tags, all those input tags that are inside the form tag, will get posted to the server. It's like the browser saying, hey, here it is, server, and you just sends a stream of bytes. Now, what is it going to post to? That's given by the action of the form. So whatever you put in here, in the action, that's where that, all that data is going to go to. Okay? That's the first change that we got to do. Because an HTML page is not going to do crap about this data. Nothing whatsoever. Okay? We need some kind of service-side scripting that will get that data validate it, okay, get rid of any viruses and injections and whatnot, and then safely save it in the database. So it's not going to be an HTML. It's going to be something, something probably called registration.php. So that's the first thing that we got to change, okay? What else? 
the submit, the unsubmit, which is j JavaScript validation, that's on the front, that's on the uh, client side. It doesn't have anything to do with the f with the back end. And the method, the method that it's going to be using is going to be a post, which means nothing will show up in the URL. The fact that I'm putting my password one two three four five is not going to show up in the URL. It shouldn't show up in the URL. Okay, means it's posting behind the scenes. Nobody knows about it. It's getting posted. It's a post. So, the first change that I want you to do on your website <coughs> and this is the website that I have in my case right I have all these HTMLs this is the eighth week, my eighth week version of the ten pages all linked together that you guys have been looking at running right now um, the first change that I want you to do is take registration page and rename it from .html to .php. That's the first thing that I want you to do. Okay? And then take the form action and put in there registration.php which means when we hit registration PHP, it's going to render the entire form empty. We're going to be able to fill it out. And when we click on register button, it will post onto itself. But basically, when you register, you should be able, at that point, be able to log in. And that's why you're sent to login page. Yes, you could do it that way, Stefan. But it's going to be much easier to do it posting at 12 self. And I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you the registration that I created in PHP is modifying the existing HTML page by starting to rename it as PHP and adding the code. Okay? So I'm going to go straight into at this point I don't want anybody to get any ideas, like some of the students in past semesters. Do you believe they took the static HTMLs, they rename it to that PHP, and that was the last project that they sent as a PHP? Obviously, when I added something in the database and I expected it to see it in their pages, it never came up. Because it was, they were still static, even though they had PHP extensions. Not a good idea to do that. Not a good idea to do that. It's very easy to detect, so please do not do that. So registration. Okay. So here's a quick comparison. Can anybody see it? Can everybody see that? Yes. So this is. This is the final version of my HTML. That's the right-hand side. And this is the final version of my registration PHP style. Okay? So what did I do? And this is something that I want you guys to start doing with all the rest of the pages. Obviously, registration is only the first one, right? But you're going to end up doing the same with all the other ones. You guys remember when I said, when you guys build your menus, your JavaScript menus, and you found on your home page that they look nice, they work. What do you have to do for all the other pages? Just copy them and paste them on every single one of the others so that you have the same menus all across. Right? Well, now we're going to start doing the opposite, which is we only want to have one menu, one set of menus. Right? We only have want to have only one set of headers. So you take all the header part. And remind me what's in the header part. The link to the cascading style sheets, JavaScript files, what else? J yeah, the jQuery, all that stuff, right? And the HTML and the head, all that stuff, you're going to copy it 
and you're going to put it into a header.html. So you're going to start putting what it's called an includes folder. I want you to start create actually an includes folder, okay, on your project. And in there, you're going to put your menus, your header, your footer, everything that is the same across all 10 pages. Okay? Okay. So, once again, how, how in PHP, how do I include other sources inside the PHP content? This is it. Include, you call include. It's actually um, include is a function. The question is, could you have done the same thing in HTML? Just take all this stuff and put it in another and then include it. No, the answer is no, otherwise we would have done it. In fact, we would have done it with the menus. Remember the menus, the one you, once you get the one menu, you had to copy and paste it in every single HTML page? Now, what's the reason that you can't do that? It's because there's no concept of include in HTML. What you're talking about is frames. When you use frames, which is an HTML tag, inside every frame you can put an HTML page. So you could create an HTML page of just header, and then make another HTML page of content, and then make another HTML page of footer, and have one page with those three frames. That you can do. But having one page where you say include from here, include from there, no. Because HTML is streamed. Okay, there's no concept of include. And there's only anchors. That's it. Now, in PHP, there is the concept of include because there is code that takes care of it. There's actual code that say, oh, there's an include. That means I have to go and find some file in the file system, bring it up, and put it here. That's done by this guy, the include. So you say, hey, PHP, include. And then you put a parameter where you will find that file. And that's all you need to do. Okay? And we have defined a page title variable with the value registration. At that point, look at this, the JavaScript that is specific for the page. Why didn't I just copy this JavaScript and put it in somewhere? Because this JavaScript is specific for this page. No other page needs it. So it stays in the page. What JavaScript is this? The one that validates that I have a username, a password, an employee type, that I make sure that I have a manager selected, that I make sure that there's a state, and if none of them are valid, I will not get the register button enabled, and therefore I will never be able to register. This is it. This is the JavaScript that takes care of that. Anyway, I already covered that, so I'm not going to cover it again. And then, notice something, notice something, that the header that I have created in a separate file is not a well-formed HTML page. Do you guys understand why? I'm sorry? Because it's going to be included somewhere else that will take care of ending the un 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 unclosed or not closed tags. Like which one? 
HTML. HTML hasn't been closed here. Header hasn't been closed here. Right? And it doesn't have a body. So it's not a real HTML page. So you got to be careful with that. Because when you try to render header.html, yeah, it's not going to like it, obviously. Right? But guess what? We know that. So in our page, we're going to keep our closed header and closed body, okay? Which we had there before. Here it is. Closed head and closed body. Now, at this point, going back to our static HTML page, I had a header div and a logo div and all that stuff, which will take care of my title. The title was Timex Online Timesheet System. Just to give you a reference, this one. Uh, this one. Timex Online Time System, right? I'm at this point here. And then, what do I have? My menus. Remember? And I explained this in another video lecture. This is my JavaScript drop down menus. It's a full UL. What I want you to do is take that UL, in fact, take the div, the entire div, okay, of your menus. All this stuff up to here. And cut it. And make another file in your includes and it's going to be called the menus HTML see that div header all this stuff exactly the same way except that now this one has going to have a little change on the menus guess what that change is going to be the registration now, there is no longer a registration.html. Now, there is something called registration.php. Please, please, as you develop your functional requirements from HTML into PHP pages, do not forget, please, do not forget to update your menus. If you don't update your menus, you're going to send me a project that you did all the work in PHP, but your menus take me to HTML pages. I'm like, what the heck? I'm going to go and add a record in the, in, the, in the database, and I'm going to go and hit your menus, and I still see the same information. I don't see where is my information coming from the database. So why? Because I go and look at the URL, and I see oh, HTML. So I have to go there and delete, 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 delete that PHP so I can get your page. Don't forget. So every time that you change one of those pages from HTML to PHP, update your menus. Okay. So what's the other change in the registration? Obviously, you're going to say, hey, PHP, I want you to include the menus. And now we're up to this point. up to this point. Okay? So, I have done already all this stuff. All this stuff in here. That you see? Up to here with includes. The first thing that you're going to notice is that your huge HTML pages are going to get cut down by half or more because of all these includes. Okay? So all you're going to do is concentrate on the actual code that you need on that page. Okay? And that's what comes next. As soon as I open my div page and inside my div content, and just to give you guys an idea where that is, I'm going to use Firebug. 
this is my sidebar this is my content and they're both inside a div page okay so the entire page is made out of the content and the sidebar okay so I'm going to keep the page and then right before the form right before the form I'm going to put code that it's going to ask hmm is this the first time that I come into this page if it is alright I'm just going to show the form empty form with all the fields empty on a uh, uh, disable register button that's the end of the story but if this is not the first time that I come into this page and this is why I'm telling you it's better when you post it onto itself you're going to say, mm -mm, this is not the first time. That means something got posted to that page. This is the second time that comes into this page. All right? And how do you ask that? Exactly. It's an if statement that said, is it set? Register in the post. Okay? If the answer to that is yes, that means the button, that button over there on the bottom got clicked. It is set. That button, by the way, it's an input tag. And that button has a value that you can ask for. And that value, if you guys look at the HTML, that value is register. I think. Where's that button, by the way? It's an input button of type submit, and the value is register. Okay? But at this point, I'm only asking for this register ID. But the second time, you have something posted. So there is a fly and say, hey, something is getting posted here. So this is not the first time. Okay? So if that variable is set, you know that it's getting posted. But let's assume it's not. Let's assume that this is the first time that we're going to. So we're going to skip all this body of the if, all of it, up to here. See that? It's telling me that's the end of that if. That's what this rectangle is telling me. And what comes next? The form. The exact same form that we had before, line by line. Okay, which is the empty page, this empty page. Got it? So at this point, I go and test it. No longer HTML. Now it's going to be PHP. Yes. You guys see this? This is PHP. As expected, it should be exactly the same as my HTML, right? After all, all I've done is rename the HTML into PHP and I'm starting to put code. And please, please do not put hundred lines of code and then test it. No. Because you're going to end up getting frustrated. Put the one if, nothing inside the if, and test it. Then put something inside the if, one or two lines, test it. If there's something weird, some formatting that gets screwed up, you immediately know that the last change that you did is what screwed up. Look on the bottom. I oh, know it's too tiny. Sorry. It says registration.php. It doesn't say registration.html anymore. We changed that. Okay? Okay. Let's go into the actual code. This is the fun part.
Okay? We're going to go into the code. Because the rest of the stuff is almost the same. So let's go into the code. Before we go into the code, I want you guys to get familiar with the names of my fields. Okay? The employee ID is called username. And remember, we go by the ID, not the name, the ID. That's what gets posted. Okay? In fact, what gets posted is a hash map, and I covered that in the first video lecture. A hash map with name, value. The name comes from the ID attribute of the tag, and the value comes from the value attribute of the tag. Okay, so employee ID is username. Employee full name is full name. <laughs> password is password. Reenter password is reenter password. Email is email. Employee type is employee type. Manager is manager. Address is address. City is city. State is state. Zip code is zip code. And the register is register. The, uh, the submit button is register. Okay. Sounds good. Let's look at the code. The code said, okay, if register is set, that means there's po uh, data posted in here. This is what I'm going to do. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to open the connection to my database. And I went through this in the first video lecture. Okay, there's a set of steps that you gotta take to open the um, the database. The problem is, it's the same three steps that you're gonna have to do on every page. So it's code that makes sense to just put it aside as a separate PHP and then include it. And that's exactly what I did here. I said, require once this code. Whoa. Wait a minute. Didn't you say it was include? What's up with this require once? So it's an include? Well, wait a second. The include of the file has PHP, PHP code that got to be run. You guys all this time have been thinking about client side. Just HTML, this happens on the... From here on, you guys are going to have to imagine that this stuff is not happening on the, on the browser. It's happening somewhere in some web server. Away from the browser. Okay? So this is all stuff that when somebody hits whatever, 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 registration.php, and you hit that and you that do that request to a web server, the web server, before it sends back the response, is going to see, wait a minute, this is PHP. That means I'm going to have to do a lot of work before I actually produce the final HTML that my browser is waiting for. Okay? And this is one of the legwork that they, it has to do. It has to include this page so it has to go into the file system and include it. And it, has, and it has this file that it has to include and interpret. PHP is interpreted. PHP is not compiled, guys. It's not like Java. There, there's a compiler. You do a modification, then you tell the compiler to do bytecode. And then you execute the bytecode. Then you go and modify the source code, then you tell the compiler to the uh, compiler, and then it cr generates different bytecode. No. This is interpret. Which means the Apache, the WAMP that you guys install, okay? The, we the Apache web server that only knows about HTML, when it sees somewhere in there in the URL a PHP, it's going to say, oh my god, I know who can take care of this. There is somebody called a PHP interpreter, and it just sends it to that guy. 
It's a dynamic linked library that gets installed in the case of the Windows version. A dynamic linked library that gets installed that will take that request from the Apache web server and says, oh, okay, I have to run this code. Okay? So every time, every time you see this, open PHP, close PHP, that's a call from the Apache web server to the PHP interpreter. I don't know what this is. You take care of it. I don't know what this is. You take care of it. Okay? So, in this case, in this case, we're telling it that we are requiring this file. So it's going to be included and interpreted. Not only that, I want, I required it once and only once. Which means if my page requires this MySQL I connect file in the page, somewhere in the page, many times, it's going to do the request only once. And like you said, it's going to cache it. Okay, so that because if we just do require every time that it sees a require, it's going to oh, bring it back, oh, bring it back. And if there's a lot of them in your website, then you're going to be doing a lot of hitting between Apache and PHP, and you don't want that because that means it's more time on the web server trying to figure out how to how to do how to create the response for you. Okay. So require once MySQL connect that PHP. <gasps> and who's that guy? MySQL connect PHP. Here it is. It's an actual file that I created that takes care of my connection to the database. And I explained this in the first video lecture. But I'm going to explain it very quickly again here. In in the first video lecture I go through three different steps. Right now I try to simplify it as as possible. You define a constant called the DB user, which is going to be root. Please always make it root. You're going to define another constant called the database password, which will always be empty. Please always make it empty. You're going to define another constant that it's going to call, be called DB host, which is going to go against your local host. We're not going to have our own database server somewhere in the cloud for us. It's going to be just our local MySQL database server, so localhost is good enough for everybody. For you when you develop in your laptop, and when, when I take your project and grade it on my laptop. Database name, that's up to you. In my case, I call it Timex. Then I'm going to take all those constants, and I'm going to say, Hey, PHP, MySQL, I connect. Okay? MySQL I connect. That's a that's a, a function, and you're gonna see that PHP is full of all types of functions, many functions, and that's why PHP is so simple. You need to do something. Oh, I bet there's a function for it, and all you have to do is call it and fulfill the parameters. In this case, what are the parameters? The constants that you just defined. The host, the DB user, the DB password, and the DB name. If you can get this to connect, you're going to die. Which means the execution of this program will halt. And you will die with this statement. Could not connect to MySQL. This will get printed on your page. Okay? Now, there is typically, when there's something wrong with the connection to the database, there is typically a function that will tell you what was the error. So you call that function, and it's MySQL I connect error. It will tell you what was wrong. Oh, the database is down. Oh, the password is wrong. Oh, whatever. Okay? Got it? All right. So now you're requiring this MySQL connect. That means that code that you just got, that I just got explained, will get loaded and run before this one is run. 
Now we're going to initialize an error array. And this is what I'm going to do in this with this error array. I'm going to do server side validation. You guys, I have asked you to do client side validation. That was done in JavaScript. It's JavaScript that runs on your browser, goes through the stuff that you input, making sure that it's good, that it's valid, that it's within the range before it gets posted on the server. Well, guess what? Sometimes some of that stuff is not coherent with the type of data that you're expecting when you get that posted. So you want to do server-side validation. This validation will happen when the information gets already across the wire to the web server and it's executing on the web server. So what are we going to do? We're going to make sure that there is something under username. Okay? So there's a function called empty that will test for emptiness under username that got posted. This is an array, remember this dollar sign underscore post is an array. Containing what? Name value pairs. Okay? It's like a hash map. So I key in the key username, I get the value of username. If it's empty, guess what? I'm going to add to my errors and notice that I don't even need an index. Isn't that cool? I don't even I don't even need to know was the last one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one? Huh. Just add to the array. Okay? So I add to the array. You forgot to enter your username, whatever. Some kind of error message that displays, hey, what was wrong here? Okay? Otherwise, what are you going to do? You're going to use another PHP function. In this case, call the MySQL I real escape string function. And keep in mind, I'm not going to go through each one of these functions, okay? And, and PHP has a lot of them. But if you go and Google them, you're going to find all the documentation that you're going to need for every single function. How many parameters, what, what's the purpose, absolutely everything that you're going to need. Where? On php.net. That's the PHP website for documentation, etc. Okay? So as it says, this function is used to create a legal SQL string that you can use in, in as a SQL statement. In other words, you're going to make sure that they didn't put some kind of query as a username. That when you try to save it in the database, it's going to execute something in your database and it's going to delete stuff or it's going to allow them, I don't know, raise their pay rate or whatever. You know, do some kind of what it's called SQL injection. That's very common, and it's a security threat. So my SQL real escape string is going to make sure that username, the value of username after it's being trimmed, that the value is going to be <coughs> uh, escaped. I mean, it's got nice SQL ready for a SQL statement under that DBC. Do you guys remember that DBC? Where did, did, where did we get that DBC? In the MySQL Connect, exactly. That's the guy that will save our connection to the database. That, it, that are dangerous, yes. Any of those escape like backslash whatever, uh, you know, yeah, all that strange stuff that is not supposed to be a username, we'll get rid of it. And it does the same thing for full name. What if I didn't enter a full name? Then you forgot to enter your full name, it goes into the errors, otherwise you're just going to trim it and then escape string it and then put it in here. <coughs> okay. 
So at this point, you are creating new variables. Username, full name, email, password. <coughs> Excuse me. Notice this. This is something cool. Because this is the kind of same validation that I did on the front end with JavaScript, but I'm doing it on the back end with PHP. What is it? I'm making sure, first of all, the password is not empty, right? And then I'm making sure that the value of password is equal to the re-enter password. If it's not equal, that means the person thought that he was putting the right password twice, and he didn't. Okay, so we're gonna have to display an error message to say your password did not match the re-enter password. <coughs> and if the password is empty, then you forgot to enter your password, right? So if it's not empty, we'll try to make sure that password and re-enter password are the same. But if it's empty, then it's gonna go into the else and it's gonna add to the array your for you forgot to re-enter your password. <laughs> <clears throat> and then at this point what you do is you don't care about the rest if there's a manager if there's an employee type if there's an address this is just a business a business rule that I set okay what you do is you just escape all the other values you don't care if they're empty or not you escape the manager, you escape the employee type, you escape the address, the city, the state, the zip code. So at this point, you have a whole bunch of variables representing in PHP each one of the values that came from that form, cleaned, massaged, and ready to be saved in the database. Okay? So what's the first thing that you ask if errors is empty? What does that mean if errors is empty? That means I went through all the validations and I didn't find anything wrong with my stuff, right? So this errors here is initialized as empty. If I go through all this validation and I never said anything to errors, errors will still be empty at this point. So everything is okay. Then what do I do? Ah, I create the query with all those variables. And I don't expect you guys to know how to do the query because that's obviously a database management system course in its own, that SQL structured query language. But if you guys remember, I ask you to create a backup of your project, um, of your database. In fact, that's what's due two days from today. If you take a look at the backup of my database, you will see that it creates department and inserts departments. It creates employee and inserts employees. This is, this is an example right there. This is an example of a structured query language that inserts one record into your database. And what you have to do is take a copy of that, okay, put it in your code, put it in your code, insert into employee, employee ID, all that stuff, blah, 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 right? And then instead of putting these values separated by commas, you're just going to replace them with the variables that you just cleaned. These variables. Okay. And then, ah, you got it. And then, what you're going to do is, those values that you do not get from the registration, you're going to set them 
initially to zero, blank, whatever. True, false, depending on what type of field. In my case, I did not allow in registration to tell me what's your pay rate or tax rate. Right? So I just set the value 0.00, .00 for the pay rate and 0 for the tax rate. Got it? What about for the registration date? For the registration date, there is a SQL function called now. N-O-W, open parentheses, close parentheses. Any database, relational database management system knows that now means putting here the timestamp right now. So it will get registered when this employee registered. Okay? And then for the password, there is a function called SHA or SHA-1, which what it does, it takes clear text and produces an encrypted big screen, a big string, okay, equivalent to that password. It's a hash function, which means you cannot take that huge encrypted string and reverse it and figure out what was the original password. It's a one-way function. That's what you want. You don't want anybody to be figuring out anybody's passwords. Yes. It's set as VARCHAR 255. Because SHA will generate 255 characters. And it's going to be all kinds of characters, uh, capital letter, lowercase, numbers, blah, blah, you know, all kinds of characters. That will be the hashed equivalent of that password. Okay? It has been proven that it's not the safest anymore. There is a way to figure out how to do the unencryption of a SHA-1 which is why they came up with SHA-2 much harder and about a few months ago they came up with SHA-3 so far impossible so I don't know if PHP has they probably don't have SHA-2 yet let me see if they have SHA-2 Crypt. Maybe it's called Crypt. I don't know. Or maybe you need a special library. Yeah. Don't use don't use any any uh, any any anything different than SHA-1, please, because sometimes what I do is I take my password one two three four five, generate the SHA, and then just put that SHA in your database. So whatever password your users chose to register as, I'm going to turn them into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. <laughs> so I can test your stuff. You know what I mean? All right. <sighs> Any questions so far? Ah. That's a very good question, Stefan. In fact, that's something that is coming up following week. When you log in, what's the process of authenticating somebody? You're asking for username and password. You post that data into the server. The server says, oh, okay, username. Let me see if there's somebody with that username. So it goes quickly into the database and it's going to look for what in the database? It's going to look for anybody with that employee ID. 
Let me see. Oh, I found him or her. Right? And then you see, oh, and this is the password. So what you do is, you cannot figure out what's the real password from that garbage. But you can take the password that he or she gave you and shot it and compare it to the password that you save in the database. That's why hash functions, one-way hash functions, are so useful. Because the product is not readable. It's totally encrypted to the human eye. And yet, with the same password, you can always get the same hash function result. Okay? And no other one, which is... That would be a problem. Because two passwords could generate the same hash function result. No. That's a collision. And that's why... Um, um, hash functions, one-way hash functions are not that easy. I mean, it's been... <sighs> developers have been struggling with this for 40, 50 years, and they have come up with SHA-1, SHA-2, and SHA-3. That's it. Okay? So, it's not easy stuff. It's mathematical groups and whatnot, statistics, etc. Okay, so you finally create a SQL statement. It's a structure query language query. And you set it into a variable. Whatever, dollar sign, Q, whatever. All right? That's your, that's your query against the database. That's, that query, when you execute it in the database, is going to allow you to insert into your employee's table that registration. And if it doesn't work, please, what I want you to do, if it doesn't work, is I want you to echo that guy immediately okay echo that guy please and then die what is that gonna do it's gonna run your program all the way validation etc etc et up to here and it's gonna spit back to you this is the query that I'm trying and if it doesn't work, what I want you to do is copy and paste that query and put it in your... Yes, put it in here. SQL. You go into SQL and you paste it in here. And then you try the query. And it will tell you what's wrong with it. And you can play with it. Let me see, let me see if, it's, if it's a com... Uh, uh, a double quote or a single quote that it's expecting and then you try running until you figure out what's wrong with that query and you say ah I got it I was missing a comma so you go ahead and copy it back again and you put it in here and you fix the problem okay Don't start scratching your head and getting crazy. Oh my God, this thing is not saving the registration in the database and I don't know why. Echo it and die. When you figure out why, you get rid of your echo and your die. Again, do two, three statements at a time and run it. Okay? What else? You finally say, hey, database, run this query. So you pass the connection to the database, and you pass the query. And it should come back with true or false. I did it or I didn't. And then you test. Did you? Did you do it? And if you did, then you're going to say, thank you. You are now registered as an employee, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Click here to log in. You notice that I'm producing PHP, um, I'm producing HTML content, right? 
in my echoes. What if it didn't go okay? What if the query didn't run? Because, I don't know, something is wrong with the query. Maybe the database is down. Hey, it's, maybe it's not your code. Maybe something is wrong with the database or whatever. So you're going to say, sorry, system error. You could not be registered due to a system error. We apologize for any inconvenience. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Right? And then you spit out the SQL error that just you don't really know. This is a debugging message. This is for you to know. I mean, users typically don't want to know the SQL error. Right? Or the faulty query that didn't run. But anyway, whether you're saying... I'm sorry we couldn't, or thank you, now you're registered. The next thing that you're going to do is you're going to close the connection to the database. Please, please do not leave database connections open. Because when you start running, you won't notice it. It's open, and then you run it again. Creates another connection. And then you run it again. Creates another connection. By the 20th 25th connection, you run out of connections in the pool. And then you're going to start getting all crappy, all kind of error message that you're going to say, I don't know what on earth is wrong with this thing. And the only way that you can fix it is going into WAMP, going into your WAMP, going into MySQL, and stopping the service and restarting it. Okay, that will clean the whole pool of connections, and you start with a clean slate. Yes, question. No, the require once is just saying, grab this file, include it in here, and run it. And next time that somebody else asks for that, don't go ahead and look for it and include it and run it. You already had run it. Okay, but the connection is still open. Remember that file never closed the connection. In fact, it shouldn't, because if it closes the connection, then we can't do any of this query stuff. So right after you have done all the query stuff, please close the connection. And then look at this: uh, the footer gets included. Where did that come from? Well, if you guys take a look at the registration HTML, right after the form, here it is. There it is. This section. Copyright, 2012, Timex, online timesheet system, Acme company, whatever, whatever. What I did is I put it in the footer HTML, and then I include it. So cut it from the page, make it a footer HTML, include it. That's it. Exit. That means we're done. Okay? But what if, what if we didn't get empty errors? Right now we're going through the nice path that everything is cool, right? I was able to register, I was able to do everything. What if there's errors? You can't save this stuff into the database. You can't run any queries to it. Okay, but you got to report it. So what I need you to do is go through your errors and display them on the page one by one, so the user knows what's wrong with the uh, with the registration. And how do you do that? Say, hey, there were errors. The following errors occurred, and then you do it's an array, right? So for each member in the array, you're going to call a message. What you're going to do is you can display the message. Next line. 
display the message next line and you're going to do that until you exhaust all the errors please watch the first video lecture if you don't understand this syntax and then at the end you say please try again so you're going to end up with a page like this with errors here and until you fix those errors it won't let you okay that's one of the ways PHP also has four loops and then make sure that you close your database connection okay at the end of every possible end of the road like this was an end of the road for successful registration so you gotta make sure that you close the database but this one is an unsuccessful path right so you gotta close the database as well the rest of the stuff look at this the rest of the stuff is the exact same HTML that you guys gave me the exact same HTML that you guys gave me so all you have to do is work on the PHP code now the PHP, co PHP code will generate HTML okay and that's something that I want you to keep in mind if my HTML has a cascading style sheet that make H1 a certain way and I want it another way or I have to indicate a class then you gotta put it in here H1 class equals whatever because if you just leave it like that like H1 you're gonna see the nice page the way that you submitted to me last week right and then you're gonna see this thank you which is like Ugh, what is that thank you doing in the middle of that page doesn't have the same look and feel as the rest of the page because it's missing the style okay so make sure that even though you're generating this code in PHP you're generating this content I'm sorry in PHP code you gotta stay loyal to your styles so make sure that you make that H1 with your styles well remember the styles are applicable to HTML tags and this is an HTML tag so if you had your H1s with a certain class so that they will look with a certain style then you don't have to but it depends on the style. The p every template is different. Remember, you guys downloaded templates. That means pre-existing styles that work with pre-existing HTML. Right? And you customize your HTML to go with that style. That's what you've been doing the last six, seven weeks. Right? what I'm saying is the fact that you're creating PHP code doesn't mean that you have to do it differently you have to be faithful to those styles even in PHP code other than that this is it guys and then we move on into login and then we move on into timesheet list and then we move on into all these different functional requirements and one by one you're going to start nailing them down and you're going to start seeing that you yeah, cut this cut that and you just concentrate on the one piece that you need on the page you add that code and the rest of HTML should fall through now when I start next week we're going to do login and then the following week we're going to do timesheet list no I'm sorry next week we're going to do login and timesheet list and then the following one we're going to do enter hours and approve timesheets so next week I'm going to be covering the login which is something very similar to this but 
I'm going to be covering timesheet list. Timesheet list, if you guys remember, I had a whole bunch of HTML because I have one row for every timesheet. And I repeat it over and over again with different values, but I repeat it over and over again. You're going to see that all that stuff gets deleted. You just keep one timesheet the way the it's displayed and you just modify it to include the name of the variables, the PHP.